All right, well, let me go ahead and open us up in prayer. God, we thank you so much for this day. I thank you for these folks that are here tonight. Thank you for their commitment and for their willingness to be a part of uh, what you're doing here at Coons on Air Base and what you're doing in your kingdom. And I thank you for each of them. I pray that you'll bless them and keep them and that you'll uh, just honor their uh, commitment to be here tonight. Lord, well, we give this time to you tonight as we start talking a little bit about uh, exactly how to do evangelism. Uh, pray that you'll guide this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I missed you guys last week. Uh, you know, when we were out, I, 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 it's like Monday night, as I mentioned to you, my brother was there, and you know, I joke about us sitting around watching Jeopardy and drinking pot, but really, that's not too far off from what life is like with my brother. So uh, I hope you had a good Memorial Day, and I know I've been praying for each of you. I hope you've been praying for me. Uh, last time we met, we talked a little bit about that, if you'll recall, about uh, the importance of corporate prayer, about the importance of uh, praying for the church, and praying for each other, and praying that God will uh, give us all opportunities to be a witness <coughs> for Him. And, and we even got into details about uh, how we look in the, in the scriptures and how uh, when the persecution came, they didn't ask for God to stop it. They asked for God to give them more boldness. So I do hope you've been praying for me, because I know I've been praying for you, and I know that I need the prayer, and I need the practice, which is why I've been praying for you. So with that, uh, up until now, we've talked mostly about the, the why for evangelism. If you recall, in, in, in session one, we talked about what evangelism is. And evangelism is, uh, we really share, it, it, we see it's very rooted throughout Scripture, the God wanting all of creation to know his glory and to experience his glory. And so evangelism is bigger than uh, what a lot of people have when they have that image of evangelism. Uh, if you recall, we talked a little bit about the fact that uh, some people have that image, it's just knocking on doors or it's just the guy in the big arena. And can those things be evangelism? Yes, but evangelism is much bigger than that. Uh, and, and when we look scripturally, evangelism uh, involves someone's whole life. It involves their, their entire being. And then in session two, we looked a little bit at three spiritual disciplines. We looked at prayer, we looked at, at fasting, and we looked at Bible study and how they prepare the individual to be able to share their faith. And I challenged uh, those of you that were here to uh, put one of those into practice. And a few of you did come to me. Uh, a few people did share in our big group, but a few people came to me uh, in private too and said, hey, you know, I tried fasting. And, oh, it was brutal, but you know what? I'm glad I did it because I grew as a result of it. Uh, and then last week we talked about corporate prayer. Well, tonight we're going to be now getting into the how. And, and I preface this by saying uh, form should follow function. And that's why we didn't start with the how. A lot of evangelism seminars just go to the how. You know, how do you share your faith. But it's important to have the background on that. And so form is important. How many of you have ever been, done this? Anybody know what that is? What is it? Running shoe analysis. It's like running shoe analysis. It's a gait test, right? Anybody ever been to those? Mm -hmm. if, if you haven't, uh, they actually will do a lot for you. In 2007, I ripped a muscle in the middle of my knee. Now, I've been running... At that point, I'd been running for 20 years. Uh, I, I ran cross country in high school. Uh, running is something I've done for a long time. Uh, and I never really had a problem with running. And then I tore a muscle in the middle of my knee. And uh, it healed. And then guess what happened? I tore it again. And so I ended up going to a, a sports medicine doctor. She was actually the sports medicine doctor for the Colorado Avalanche. And because uh, we were in Colorado. And she asked the question, she's like, maybe it has something, have you had your running checked? And she recommended that I do that. And what the test showed was the way I was running, if you can see this, I know on the camera you won't be able to see this, I was step, step, instead of step, step. And so I was, I, I was crossing my legs and didn't even realize it, but it was really apparent in that. And so I use this as an example to lead us off to say that form is important. It's important uh, that we they do the right things the right way. And that's a little bit of what we're going to focus on uh, tonight. Now, in, in past sessions, I introduced the concept of the diffusion of innovation theory uh, developed by Everett Rogers. And, and basically, it's a theory that uh, 
that sees the how do people adopt an innovation. And if you recall, in, in, in session two, I spoke of Vivian as the gospel as being an innovation. It's not new. It's been around you know, for 2,000 years, and arguably, if you really want to go there, longer. It was born within the heart of God in, in Genesis 3 when he promised that, that the offspring would defeat Satan. Uh, but it's an innovation to those who do not know it. And we do know that it's, it's better. And, and, and last, week, last session, we, we looked at uh, the, the uh, innovation de decision model and recognized that really we can only take people so far. We can only give people information about the innovation that is the gospel. Ultimately, the Holy Spirit has to do the rest. And so evangelism, study of evangelism truly is a study in the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit works. Now another thing I want us to take away from the diffusion of the innovation theory is the concept that airmen evangelists, and that's what you are, that's really what all of us are, airmen evangelists are in fact uh, change agent aides. And, and what is a change agent aide? Essentially a change agent aide is someone that is involved in helping a change happen uh, within is there something specific you're looking for? Just a board game, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Probably too slow. Sorry about that. Okay, we are videotaping here. Sorry about that. All right. So, a change agent aid is essentially someone who uh, is involved in helping to disseminate an innovation, but someone who is not doing that professionally. Now, as I look around the room, we have a variety of uh, career fields here. Uh, we have a dentist in the room. We have uh, your, your vehicle maintenance, but you kind of watch people work on vehicles. And, and your money guy. I mean, we have a variety of different career fields in here. But none of you are paid to be evangelists. In fact, I'm not actually paid to be an evangelist. The Air Force does not pay me to be an evangelist. And so a lot of times people will think, well, it's the chaplain's job to, to evangelize. Well, actually, it's not. And we'll, next session, I'll show you a little bit why it's so important to have people in every single career field who have a passion for God, who have a passion uh, for the gospel. And so uh, Everett Rogers in his book states that, uh, that change agent age should be chosen according to gender, formal education, and personal acquaintance with the client system. That's a fancy way of saying diversity, okay? And, I don't, and when I say diversity, I mean we need enlisted, we need officers, we need men, we need women, we need maintainers, we need finance people. We need all kinds of people who will be involved in evangelism. And so you as airmen who uh, love the Lord, that is your role, your change agent aides. And ultimately, even, I would submit to you that those who uh, are professional evangelists are really change agent aides. Because again, studying evangelism is a study in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who really uh, makes things happen. Now, what I want to do is show you a few examples of evangelism in Scripture. Now, most of these come out of the book of Acts. Uh, but there are, and when I say evangelism, there are what what is introduced in the first session, the passive evangelism individuals, the individuals who've lived out good lives and who uh, people came to know the Lord as a result. Uh, yesterday in my sermon, I brought up uh, the story of Ruth. I would say that, uh, that Naomi would be one of those uh, because Ruth was compelled to go with her, that Naomi, in living out her faith, uh, compelled Ruth to then shift her allegiances. She was no longer worshiping the God of Moab, she worshiped the God of Israel. And so I would say to, say to you that she, in fact, by the definition of evangelism, was an evangelist because God used her to reach someone. But when we talk about evangelists in, in our examples here, we're talking about people who actually proclaimed the gospel. Well, there was Peter, if you remember in Acts chapter 2, uh, he didn't wake up that morning and decide, hey, I'm going to preach a sermon. Does anybody remember what happened? The Holy Spirit came, and all the people who saw it thought the people who had the Holy Spirit were drunk. So really, his first sermon was just a response to people thinking they were liquored up. And you know, he says, hey, you know what, it's only 9 in the morning. Uh, they, they don't have, the hooches aren't even open. Uh, that's basically what he was saying. 
But then he goes and shares the gospel to him. And his gospel message essentially was, Jesus is God, you killed him, he's back. That's essentially what his message was. And then they were said they were stricken with fear. What do we need to do? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Ghost. 3,000 of them did it. Okay? So we have Peter. And then Peter and John in court. If you shift back a chapter, Acts chapter 3, a beggar comes to them and says, hey, you know, he's begging for money. Uh, Peter and John say, we don't, we don't have any silver and gold, which was proof that they were preachers. But uh, they said, what we do have, we'll give you in the name of Jesus, walk. And so what happens to them? They get to go to court because they, they help the guy walk. Does that seem ludicrous to anybody? Does that just think about that? You heal the guy. What are you going to do now? I'm going to go get sued. It happened. Philip, and if you remember, Philip was, was a, he, he was a deacon. And uh, he... The Holy, the scriptures say the Holy Spirit put him on a road where there was an Ethiopian eunuch who, who happened to be reading the book of Isaiah. Of course, not an accident. And uh, as a result, Philip gets to explain the gospel to him. Uh, and, and sometimes that happens in our lives. God gives us those examples. Uh, and then there's Peter in response to a centurion's vision. Uh, this was the, the example of the first Gentiles who were evangelized. A centurion had a vision that Peter was going to tell him something, so the centurion sent someone, and he, he, he came and he told them. Now, Paul and Silas, uh, this was in Philippi. Uh, they, were, they were jailed because there was a, they were there in Philippi preaching the gospel, and there was a demon-possessed girl, and, and she kept following them, and, and so they just, they just cast out the spirit. Again, you do something good, you get punished. Went to jail, they were beaten really good, they were singing. Uh, they were praising God. The, 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 the doors opened to the jail. And the jailer came in, and uh, Peter and, I mean, Paul and Silas, rather, told them that uh, all the people were still there. Now, the penalty within Roman law was if you're a jailer and someone escapes, guess what happens to you? You're done. So this jailer had never seen anything like that. And so when he recognizes that the gates have been opened and nobody left, what does he do? What shall I do to be saved? And as a result, he and his household came to Christ. Again, Paul and Silas, they were in a town called Berea. And I put that up there, dialogue with dutiful Bereans. And I think this is a good example because this kind of is maybe where many of you may find yourself. Because the Bereans were people with questions. And they were people who, who didn't just want easy answers. They actually wanted to get some proof behind it. Uh, they, they, were, they were the intellectual types. Uh, but uh, it, the scriptures tell us that Paul and Silas worked with them, and, and they studied the scriptures to see if it was true. And the reality is we, we know people who are like that, who are going to have problems, uh, have problems with what they did believe, and they're going to be looking at Christ, and they're going to be looking at Christianity, and we'll be able to form those long-term relationships with them. Uh, brag on my wife a little bit. Uh, she has a dear friend that she went to high school with, and that's been many moons ago. Uh, my wife's not ashamed of her age. Her 20-year her, uh, class reunion was two years ago. And yet there's this young lady, she went, well, she's a nice middle-aged lady. She's still young, right? They're still younger than me, so they're young. Uh, that she's been talking to since high school, and, this, and, and I won't say her name, not to call her out if she sees the YouTube video. She knows who she is. Uh, but every time she has questions, she calls Shannon. And so Shannon and her have had this dialogue for like probably 24 years about the gospel. And Shannon has presented the gospel to her. She's kind of been resistant, but still there's a dialogue. So it's still evangelism. And, and, but that's a good example of what Paul and Silas did. And then Paul, he was on Mars Hill. Mars Hill is in Athens. And uh, he happened to be in Athens. And he, he dialogued with the philosophers. Apparently there were philosophers, and the scriptures say that there were people that basically did nothing but sit around and listen for new stuff. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? I think that's like the staff of some blogs. Uh, 
basically. They just listen for new things and they blog it. It shows up on your news feed on Facebook. Uh, but Paul uh, philosophizing with them. And that's kind of an interesting uh, look into forms of evangelism because up until now we see Paul, when we see what he does, he speaks mostly to Jews. But in this example, he, he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the philosophers. It's a very different style. And then there's Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, the story tells us that Apollos uh, had heard of the baptism of John, but didn't know the rest of the story. And, and so he was out there, he was fervent uh, for, for telling people you need to repent. But he didn't know about Jesus. And so Priscilla and Aquila, and uh, they, 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 they pulled him aside. And basically they saw, hey, this guy is ready to know Christ. And sometimes that's going to happen in our lives. People, they're just, they're ripe. It's like picking, anybody ever picked fruit? There's this apple orchard near uh, Scott Air Force Base, where my family is. And uh, you can pick apples. And, uh, and they actually let you eat as many as you want while you pick. So having two teenage sons, they, they made it a competition. And, uh, one of my sons ate 22 apples. Yeah. Son, you're on your own with that one. But anyway, I digress. You know, when they're really ripe, though, you just kind of have to just take a little bit of load off the stem and just give a gentle twist, and they just pop right off. There are people that uh, if, you, if you're if you open and you're, you're listening to the Holy Spirit and you're in tune to things, there are people out there that, you know, they just, they're, they're right there, and, and, and all they need someone to do is maybe open the Bible with them or share with them a little bit, and you know, they're going to come to Christ. And that's how Priscilla and Aquila found Apollos. Again, we run into Paul. And uh, Paul was always angering the Jews. He was always angering the Jews. But we find a situation where, uh, does anybody remember anything about Paul before he was a Christian? He was, he was a Pharisee. And uh, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. There was this other group that the Sadducees, they, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe it was a resurrection, which I can't figure out. You know, if there's no resurrection, why are you even doing this? I don't, well, glory, glory to God, I guess, would be the reason. But nonetheless, um, Paul noticed that he was in a group that was split, and so he just worked that split. And he pointed out, he says, you know, it's, it's, it's because of the hope of the resurrection I'm here. And so right away, it starts a debate between them. And, and he, it seems like he may have won a couple allies through that conversation because uh, he, he, um, he made the point. You know, we're talking resurrection. How can you argue? You say you believe in the resurrection. I do too. Getting out of the book of Acts, uh, the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians is uh, written by Paul and a very hurt, angry Paul. But... Uh, the situation in Galatia was rather interesting uh, because according to Galatians chapter 4, Paul never sought to be in Galatia. Okay? It was sort of an, an unintentional visit that he had. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, maybe yesterday, you know, we looked in yesterday's sermon that sometimes God interrupts us. Well, Paul never had any plans of being in Galatia. He had some ailment, and we don't know exactly what the ailment was. Uh, there are several scriptures, and we could, time doesn't suffice, where I can show you that it was probably an eye ailment that he had uh, of some sort. Uh, there's a good chance that it was an eye ailment. But for some reason, he found himself trapped in Galatia, and he was unable to help himself. Okay? He, need, he needed to depend upon the people there. And so the people took care of him, and, and the, as a result, he shared Christ with them, and they came to Christ. And a church was born there. And so... Uh, that's a good example to show that sometimes we don't even have to plan for this stuff to happen. Uh, how many of you found yourself somewhere that you didn't want to go or found some place too long? Man, I'm stuck in this airport. Um, I can't believe I'm in this meeting. Opportunities arise. And then for a final example, I want to point to Lois and Eunice. Hey, anybody ever heard of Lois and Eunice? Well, Lois was Timothy's mom, and Eunice was Timothy's grandma. And Paul 
speaks of Timothy's faith and talks about how uh, he, he uh, saw the same faith in Lois and saw the same faith in Eunice. And I give this as an example of uh, sometimes people are nurtured in through relationships. And, and that's what I'm hoping that, that you'll be able to do, is form some relationships. Because sometimes uh, people, they see our life and they hear us talk, they hear what we say, they, hear what, they see what we do, and it happens. Now, of course, Timothy grew up seeing that. And for those of you who are parents, they've got to grow up seeing that. They really do. It makes a big difference. Uh, but that's also an example of evangelism in Scripture. So that was a real whirlwind right there of some evangelism in Scripture that took place. So with that, tonight I want us to focus on two uh, strategies for sharing our faith, two tactics rather. The first one I want us to focus on is the personal testimony. And I do have these sheets right here that uh, you don't necessarily need to fill out right now, but I'll go ahead and give them to you. Uh, and this is your homework, part of your homework, to fill it out. I'll go ahead and give these to you. Uh, personal testimony is basically you sharing what God has done for you. And we see that in Scripture. We see Paul doing that rather frequently when, when Paul shares uh, a little bit about how he came to Christ. And, and where he talks about how he was a Jew and he was a Pharisee and he was zealous for the law. And then, uh, you know, he, you know, Jesus stepped in. He was like one abnormally born, the Damascus Road experience. We see that happening. And the personal testimony, the uh, beauty of the personal testimony is, number one, it's ours. So we know it. We know how we came to Christ. Secondly, it's irrefutable. Okay. We, nobody can refute our experience. They may, they may try to refute our sanity. They may want to refute our knowledge. But you can't refute experience. You cannot tell, tell someone, no, you didn't do that, if they're saying, no, yes, I did. Okay. So personal testimony is a natural way of being able to share with someone what God has done in your life. Now, a couple I want us to look at some of the elements of the personal testimony. First of all, First element, by the way, this is adapted uh, from some material that's put out by CREW. Uh, CREW is the organization formerly known as Campus Crusade for Christ, but I guess we can't use the word crusade anymore, so it's CREW. Did they change They, they changed it to CREW, they did, because uh, of the whole, you know, the crusades were taking back the Holy Land from the infidel Arabs. Yeah, we can't do that anymore. But nonetheless, they still put out good material, and this is adapted uh, from some of their material, these elements. And the first element here is the opening. And, and essentially, uh, what you're trying to do here is you're trying to identify a theme <coughs> to, to your testimony. And uh, when I say a theme, you're in a conversation with someone, and you know, they may be open to matters of faith, or maybe they're having some trouble. Uh, what you want to look for is a connection point with what they're going through between God and them. And, and essentially that becomes the theme uh, to what you're going to share with them. And so when I say your personal testimony, it's one of those things that when you get used to sharing your faith, you can customize to the situation. Uh, because... Uh, I, know, I, I know I can speak for myself, the longer I've known Christ, the more I've realized Christ has really done for me. So I can speak to several different elements of what he has done for me. But essentially here, in identifying the theme, uh, what you're asking the question is, what did your life revolve around that God used to bring you to him? Okay, so that's, that's essentially... Uh, that's an element that would be in a testimony. And then you want to go to your life before Christ. And, and, and what you want to do is paint a picture of what your life was before Christ. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give a cautionary statement. Sometimes people think they need to embellish. You know, uh, I, I've heard, you, how many of you have ever been to those? I know we, we used to go to these when I was a youth pastor like when I was a teenager, you'd go to this arena and there'd be this guy, you know, he, was a, he was in a biker gang. You know, he, he, used to, you know, he smoked a pound of weed a day and you know, he killed 20 people and then he came to Christ in prison and now he loves the Lord. Anybody ever heard those kind of stories? Yeah, and, and they seem so dynamic, but most of us really don't have one of those, do we? Most of us, 
you know, many people, they, you know, hey, you know, I went to church every Sunday. You know, that's, that's their, come walk to Nile when I was eight. You know, that's some people. And, and then there's others, you know, there's others in between. Maybe you were an adult and, you know, yeah, your life, you did some things you're, you're not proud of. But, you know, you weren't an axe murderer, okay? So if you weren't an axe murderer, don't say you were an axe murderer, okay? Don't embellish these things. A lot of people want to do that, but you still want to, you want to paint a picture of what your life was like before Christ. And again, you don't need to go into all the details. Uh, maybe there are some pretty bad things, uh, but there's no reason to brag about how bad it was. Because uh, again, if you're bragging about how bad it was, you're not making it about Jesus, you're making it about you. And, and you don't want to do that. You also don't want to give the image that Jesus is only for axe murderers. You don't want to do that either. So uh, only share details that tie into the theme, but ultimately your goal in talking about your life before Christ is to demonstrate that there was a void in your life. There was something missing in your life. And Jesus is what you needed in your life, or who you needed in your life. And then how you came to Christ. Uh, what you're sharing here is, is kind of that moment. And for some people, they can't really remember that moment, quite honestly. Just, you know, I know people... Uh, my children all came to Christ really young, and uh, my younger two really struggled with this one. Like, they were like, you know, Jesus has been my Lord for so long, I, I can't really remember. And, you know, I remember when it happened, but they can't remember because they were little. And so, if that's you, I would say that how you came to Christ can be a how you really became aware that you were a Christian. You know, if it was later, you can say, you know, I made a commitment when I was really little, but at this point in my life, I really realized that Jesus was my Lord. Uh, you can do that. And so, uh, basically, the goal here is to present it in such a way that the person you're talking to and anybody who hears you can know how you became a Christian, and then they will be able to become a Christian as well. And so uh, that's the goal here is, is that, that aha moment. That's what you're going for here. You're going for that aha moment. And uh, this, is, this is the educational aspect of your story. And this is a place where, where you're telling them, look, if you, if, if you want to repent and come to Christ, here's how you do it. Uh, and that's, that's what you want in the story there. Then you want to focus on your life after Christ. Because honestly, he should be doing something. And, and that was something that I shared early on. Uh, I truly believe that a part of the gospel is the changed life. Uh, a lot of times, uh, as a chaplain, people come to my office and you know they walk the aisle at VBS when they were eight, but they haven't done anything with it. Um, it's not really a strong testimony. In fact, I would I would I would I would want to peel the onion with people like that and say, so do you really know the Lord? Are you sure you know the Lord? Because there hasn't been any fruit there. If you go to an apple tree, you expect to see what? Apples, right? So if there are no apples, is it really an apple tree? But anyway, the point, your life after Christ, and see, again, going back to your theme, you want to share ways that knowing Jesus addressed that void that you had before you came uh, to Christ right here. And so it's, it's, it's not mere changes in behavior, it's attitude, it's character, it's perspective. Now you don't want to make, be all pie in the sky and make it seem like life is perfect. How many of you believe life is perfect? And how many of you are honest, and I'll be honest on this one, how many of you found that you started committing yourself to the Lord and life actually maybe got a little bit harder? Anybody, is that anybody's experience? I know it was mine. I really know why, because I believe there's a devil. And I believe he's like, hey, I don't want this happening. You know, but tighten the screws a little bit on you. It happens. So the goal here is not to make yourself look perfect. Again, don't make it about you. Make it about the gospel. And the goal here isn't to just say spectacular me. And again, the goal isn't to talk about, oh, I was smart to accept Christ. Because remember, the Holy Spirit is the one who was at work there. And then there's the closing. And the goal there is to tie it all together, back to that theme. And this is a good place to use a verse, okay? So, clear as mud so far? Here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to share my testimony with you, okay? And uh, my theme, by the way, in sharing my testimony was the theme of belonging. That is the theme I went with with my testimony. 
And, and so my life before Christ as a child, I never really uh, belonged. I never really felt like I belonged. My dad had a serious mental illness. Uh, my twin brother, I'm a twin, uh, had a lot of medical issues. And so my mother was consumed with caring for my twin brother and for my dad and for the other siblings. And so I was, I was kind of the child that was expected to just quietly be over here because I've got to deal with your dad and I've got to deal with your brother. And so uh, much of my childhood was spent alone. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, that was kind of the go-to punishment for us. It's like you, you need to stay out of the way, and if you're not out of the way, well, you're going to go sit in your room. Okay, so didn't really have a lot of belonging, and as a result, as a child, I was the kid who played by themselves on the playground. I was the kid who, you know, went here by himself, and I was the, the, the kid who did that by himself. And it's not so much that I was a loner, I was just alone. And so my childhood was very lonely. And so uh, I tried to do the things to fit in, and, and guess what? They didn't work. So they only made me feel one layer. So... How I came to Christ. When I was a child, my parents took me to church. When I became a teenager, they said, you can do whatever you want. And so, wrestling on Sunday morning, I stayed home and watched wrestling. But, when I was 14, there was this boy in my scout troop, and, and he came to me, his name was Jason, Jason Smith. And Jason said, hey, I, there, there's this guy coming to our church, and they got free pizza, and... My youth pastor says i got to invite some people to church. So do you want to go to church with me? Free pizza? Okay. So I went to the church. I happened to remember the church. I was you know, a freshman in high school. I happened to know that um, some of the cheerleaders from the school went there. So I'm thinking pizza, cheerleaders from school, can't be too bad. So uh, went in there. They said free pizza. So I ate 11 pieces. And then they said it's free Coke, too, so I drank a six-pack. Uh, so, I mean, I put it down. Let's see if these people are for real. But then they said, but you got to stay for church. Okay. So there was this guy. His name was Paul Jackson. I remember Paul Jackson's name. And uh, he was a, a guy they had brought in. And he was funny. This guy was funny. He was like, uh, I'm trying to think of a comedian uh, that would compare him. Anybody ever watch Brian Regan? He was like Brian Regan funny, that kind of funny. And so, uh, my, my favorite comedian is Brian Regan. Okay. Had nothing to do with this. But, they said, you got to stick around and listen to this guy. So I'm sticking around and listening to this guy, you know, sitting there at pizza, soda, you know. Uh, but at any rate, I remember he talked about John 3.16 that night. And he talked about how Jesus died and rose from the dead. And because he died and rose from the dead, we could be a part of his family. And we could be his child. That really spoke to me that night. Because I'd heard, you know, always heard the story, Jesus died for your sins, got it. But what appealed to me that night was, well, I could have a family. Because the family at my house was no warm and fuzzy there. But I could be a part of something if, if I came to Christ. And so for the first time in my life, I felt as if, wow, I could really belong. And so that night, um, I sat down. They said, you know, they, they, it was one of those churches that has an altar call. And they said, hey, if, if what we're saying makes sense to you, why don't you come down here and talk with somebody? So I, uh, I still was resistant. Okay, this is like the key, right? And it was one of those churches where they sing the song. And, Come on down. You ever, you ever been to those churches? You know those churches? And so like on verse 78 of just as I am, I mean, I'm like gripping the pew. Because still, I mean, this sounds great. This sounds awesome. But is it for real? Can I really be a part of something here? And I don't like verse 78 or whatever. I'm like, well, I'm never going to know if I sit here. So I went down there and uh, there was this... Uh, this lady, Mona Lonsberry, I still talk to her to this day. And uh, she's like, do you need to talk? It's like, let's talk. And so we sat down and she shared with me how, how I could know Jesus and how if I knew Jesus, uh, I'd be a part of his family. And that was a real appeal to me. So that night, uh, in April of 1986, April 6th, I believe it was, uh, that night I, I 
came to know Jesus as my Savior and Lord. And so now, my life after Christ, I, I, I belong. I'm a child of God. I'm still weird, but I'm a child of God. And uh, the way God has grown me is as I've learned that I don't need to go out there and please people. I don't need to go out there and make people happy to belong. I be the belonging I have is because God is my Father, and, and I'm a Christian, and I've been redeemed, and that's where my belonging is. And so I don't need to be a people pleaser. I need to uh, praise God and, and just please Him. And I go to church, not because I have to, but, and not because uh, the, the wing commander tells me I have to, even though I do, would actually have to go. Uh, but that's not why I go. I go because I'm thankful, and that's where God's family is. It's belonging. And so I like to tell others, too, because I want them to belong. And then for my closing, uh, I chose 2 Timothy 2.19, which reads, But God's firm foundation stands, bearing his, this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So the Lord knows those who are his. So I would use that testimony if someone is kind of feeling, if I perceive that maybe they feel like I did, or uh, maybe they feel like you know they 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 don't have any standing with God. You can have standing with God. God can love you. You can be a part of His family uh, by knowing Him. So that's that's my testimony. Okay. So some tips for effectiveness: keep it authentic. If you're not an axe murderer, don't say you're an axe murderer. That's just the best way to put that. Um, keep it concise. I may have gone a little bit longer, but they say three to five minutes. You know, that's about people's listening window. It's about what people can listen to to one story. And, uh, and then keep Christ the focus. Don't make it about you. You know, a lot of people want to make it about themselves. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, as I pointed out, make it about themselves how bad they were, or make it about themselves how good they are now, or make it about themselves, oh, I was smart to accept Christ, because God's Word tells us if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't accept Christ. So it's not about our intelligence. So those are some things to remember. So that is the personal testimony. Questions so far, by the way, before we go into the next one. All right. The other technique I want to share with you is the Roman Road. And the Roman Road is basically a nickname for scriptures that you can use to lead somebody to Christ. Because they're all in the book of Romans. And uh, I like it because I, I learned this when I was 17, same church where I ate all that pizza. I uh, started going to that church. Uh, Sid Johnston was our youth pastor. Now, Sid was, he was a man's man. Uh, he was, he actually played college ball for uh, Southeastern Louisiana University uh, before they closed their team. Uh, but before that, he actually went to Vietnam. And he was drafted. He went to Vietnam. He was an infantryman. Uh, he uh, tells a story that in his platoon, uh, they got attacked. And in the attack, they've lost several guys, to include all the officers. And so everybody's platoon looked to him because he was the only NCO. And so suddenly, he's got to get his guys back. Uh, they're like 10 miles from, from camp. And suddenly, he's now in charge of this platoon. He gets back and on the spot is commissioned as a second lieutenant. Uh, but I say that to say this guy has seen some grisly stuff. Uh, he's, he's with the Lord now. But he had seen some grisly stuff, and as a young believer, I was really drawn to that. I mean, seeing grisly stuff, the guy's got deer heads on his wall and drives a Jeep. Uh, I mean, this is my kind of guy. So I wanted to do everything I could to hang around Sid, because this guy was dripping coolness to me. And uh, Sid taught this to me, uh, because I was talking with him one day, and, and there was a couple people at, at, at my high school that I wanted to share Christ with, and I said, you know, I just, I'm not so good with the Bible, you know. You know, if you ever look at somebody and they're good with the Bible, just remember, encourage yourself with this. There was a point when they were, okay? Don't get discouraged. But I said, I'm just not so good with the Bible. I can't go to, you know, Joshua, and I'm going to go to Jeremiah, and Obadiah. I don't know why you use any verses out of Obadiah to lead somebody to Christ. But at any rate... He shared this with, method with me. He says, can you find the book of Romans? I said, I can find the book of Romans. I can do that. It's, it's uh, you know, I'm still at that point where I'm like, Romans, Romans. You, you know that, that thing in the front of your Bible? 
It just lists them in alphabetical order. I'm yeah, still at that point. It's like, okay, find the Book of Romans. Okay. All these verses are on the Book of Romans. That's what makes it uh, so beautiful. So uh, there are different variations on the Roman road. This is the one that I was brought up with. So it's the one I'm sharing with you. And I will actually have those here for you right here. Now, all these verses are in the ESV translation. Uh, I don't want to sound like a translation prude. It's my favorite. Use the translation that you're comfortable with. Okay? Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's where I start out. Now, there are some things that jump out of that verse to you. What are some things that might jump out at you? The power of God. It's the power of God. Right. To people who feel powerless, that's important. And when people, when the Holy Spirit's at work in people's lives, oftentimes they're at that point where they realize that what they're doing isn't working. So they feel powerless. They're looking for someone who's powerful. Anything else jump out to you? I know there's one word that wants to see. It's the word everyone. What's that? It's everyone. Everyone. Right. Everyone who believes. So... Okay, I don't think any of you are axe murderers, but we're talking about the axe. Let's say you're talking to an axe murderer, and they think, well, I'm beyond God's reach because I'm an axe murderer. You can share this verse with us. It's like, wait a minute, no, it doesn't say everyone but axe murderers. If you remember when Jesus was on the cross, he, was, he had two thieves on either side, but the reality was they were probably more than thieves if they were being hung on a cross. They were probably murderers. Uh, they were probably insurrectionists. And, and yet, the one said Jesus... Remember me when you come into the kingdom. And what did Jesus tell him? This day you will be with me in paradise. This day you will be with me in paradise. So that everyone counts. And so people need to know when you share the gospel with them, this is for everybody. And then there's Romans 3.10. 3.10 and 3.23 really get them lost as I see it. People need to know they, they need Christ. It says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. Now, what kind of things, if, if you... Maybe you've said these. Maybe you've heard other people say these. What happens when people tend to be confronted with their own sinfulness? What do they tend to do? Don't compare. Go ahead. Go ahead. I said defensive. They become defensive. They compare. I'm not like. I'm not like so and so. Worse than I am, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I've never killed anybody. I. I, I well, my wife, I, I don't. They bring out the scale. They bring out the scale, exactly. <laughs> People love the scale. They love the scale. They think God's up there, he's got the scale, right? Just like the, the judge, you know, like the, the statue in front of the Supreme Court. I think it's in front of the Supreme Lady Court Justice. the scale. What's that? Lady Justice. Lady Justice, right. They think of Lady Justice, only it's old man justice. That's what they think God is. And so they bring out the scale. That, that's perfect. But yet we read this verse, it says, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. Does the scale matter? It doesn't. If God did have a scale, we would be found wanting, every single one of us. And so, helping people to see this, and then Romans 3.23 is paired up with it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Also rings true there. All have sinned. Falls short. Now remember, what does God want more than anything? We learned about this in the first session. He wants his what to be known? Everywhere. He wants his glory to be known everywhere. Even we see in Genesis uh, chapter 1, he, he made man in his own image. And by making man in his own image, male and female, he made them. <coughs> Got to clarify, it's not male, it's humankind. Uh, he did that so that his image would be known all over the world. The fact that God made humanity is proof that God is an evangelistic God. That God wants his glory to be known. And yet, because we sin, we're way outside of his plan, right? That doesn't sound like a good place to be, does it? To be outside the plan of God. But then we start to get hope here. Up until now, you know, people know there's power. We've kind of got them lost here. And then there's Romans 5.8, which tells us, but God shows his love for us 
and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Anything ring out to you in those verses? While we were still sinners. That's what jumps out to me. While we were still sinners. I actually noticed the show's love part too. My, do my daughter said that uh, one boy came to her in middle school and told her that, uh, that God doesn't love God doesn't love him because he's an orphan. And I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> he loves orphans. He loves orphans. Go through, I mean, did, you do a study of orphans in scripture, widows and orphans. Yeah. There's, yeah, God loves them. And, and he wants to be their father. Yeah. But that while we were still sinners, that always amazes me. That just truly amazes me. Uh, because we live in a world of merit. And in the Air Force, we really live in a, in a, a society of merit. Uh, you know, the EPR and the OPR, the P stands for what? Performance. performance. Right. We live in a world where performance is everything. And if you're performing uh, and the right people see you perform, you move up. And if you're not performing, you move out. Okay? That's the way it is. Our favor as military members is, at least in theory, completely tied to what we do. And yet, we have a verse like this that says, not only was it... Not what we did. It was in spite of who we were. Christ died for us. And just, just think about that. Isn't that beautiful? In spite of who we are, Christ died for us. So if you, if you have that person, that person that says, I'm an orphan, I'm unlovable, or, you, or you know, I've done these horrible things, this is real hope here. Because it says, look, God knew it, and yet Jesus died for us anyway. So then... Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Anything jump out to there to you? Free gift. Free gift? Free gift. Free gift. I think we all understand wages, right? We all have some sort of agreement with the Air Force that they're going to pay us and we're going to do something. Whether it be a commission or an enlistment or something, there's some. We did some. We negotiated some terms with the Air Force, and, and and if we don't get paid, we come to you. And why aren't we getting paid? And we fix it, and we get paid. You know, that's just how it works. Um, I don't like those that payment. I don't like it at all. That that death. That does not sound like a good payment. But then the free gift of God. In other words, here's what we heard, but here's what we get. Beautiful. And then Romans 10, 9, and 10. And I always use this. This is the gospel in a verse. How do you come to Christ? Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Now let me stop there. A lot of times people want to add things in. Uh, they want to it's complicated and say, well, you have to do this and you have to do that. Or you have to walk an aisle of a church. Or you have to pray this prayer that's on the back of a gospel tract. Uh, it's confessing with your mouth Jesus is Lord. That's what it says. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Do you know there are people who claim to be Christians who don't believe in the resurrection? And yet Paul says that if there is no resurrection, we are to be most pitied. Back to verse chapter 1 and verse 16. The power of God into salvation is tied to the resurrection. So... Believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses is saved. So, what do we have to do? We have to confess and believe, right? Pretty simple. Nothing else we need to do. And then I throw Romans 12, 1 and 2 in there because there, there's, there's an idea that, that runs around within within Christianity in our generation. That normal Christians go to church, but they don't really live it during the week. And the weird ones live it all the time. But the reality is, no, it's normal for us to, to grow. Again, apple trees do what? Produce apples. If I got an apple tree that's not producing apples, I do what? I figure out why it's not producing apples. You know, and in fact, Jesus said, you know, he gave a parable about that. You know, let me, you know, the, the servant said, let me dig around it, let me fertilize around it, and, 
you know, and let's give it a year, and if it doesn't produce fruit, then cut it down. Um, I'm not talking about losing salvation here. But what I'm saying is, it's normal for us to bear fruit. So I think that we need to set that expectation from the get-go when we share Christ with someone. And say to them, if you come to Christ, if you profess that Jesus is your Lord, there are some expectations that come with that Lordship. And this verse tells them to us, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do you guys know that you're actually a sacrifice? And when Paul spoke this, he was speaking in contrast, really, to the, the Jewish system of, I did this, so I got to kill a goat. I did this, and I got to kill a bull. Like, I did this, I got to bring this grain offering. And yet, our version of sacrifice is making our whole life, our whole being, that sacrifice. And he says, don't be confirmed to this world. Conformed. Confirmed. Different words. Conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, we think differently, don't we? And the Bible helps us to think differently. Um, and the reason being is that we may be able to test, by testing you may be able to discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. How many of you have discovered as you've grown in the Lord you think differently? Died to self. Huh? Died to self. You die to yourself, right. There's this, we, it's normal for us to think differently. In fact, it's normal for people maybe to think you're a little bit off because you just don't see things the way they do. And you'll find yourself at times saying something that just makes total sense to you and then you'll, you'll, you'll find everybody in the room just giving you a blank stare. Um, you know, it could be on a number of issues. It could have to do with marriage. And, and, and you know, uh, maybe somebody's talking about the problem with their marriage and you mention something like, well, maybe you and your, you and your spouse need to, you know, Pray more and commit to each other, but you need to work through this. And everybody else in the room is saying, no, if you're not having fun, labor. That's how the world thinks. And then they all look at you like you're nuts because you're saying work it through. You're saying to them holiness is more important than happiness. That's not the way the world thinks, but that's the way the scripture thinks. And so I throw that verse in there to say to people, and this is important for people coming to Christ because they still may be struggling with, their sinfulness. But to be able to say to them, God is going to transform you. And you're, that struggle is going to uh, become, it's going to be transformed. You're not going to struggle the way you did because God is going to change your life. So that is the Roman road. Just some verses here uh, that, would, that you can use when you share your faith with others. So any questions on that so far? And by the way, I will preface that Scripture is the way people come to the Lord, because the Scriptures tell us that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the words of Jesus Christ. That's how people come to know the Lord. So uh, this is one set of Scriptures I like to use. But if you if you say, well, you know, I really like to use the book of Obadiah, I'd like to hear what you use out of the book of Obadiah. But the point being, Scripture is where the power of God is. And so you need to be able to use Scripture. So any thoughts on, on the Roman road there? All right, well, for homework, what I'd like to ask you to do is, is two things. Um, and again, as I always tell you, homework isn't a requirement to come the next week, but it will help you to apply the lessons. First of all, I gave you the testimony worksheet. And, and what I'd like for you to do is, is to, to write this out, and then to find somebody to share it with. And, and for some of you, you're thinking, I don't know if I'm ready really to share my thing. It could be another Christian. It could be somebody in the chapel. It could be a, a brother or sister in Christ. But find somebody to share it with because you need to get accustomed to sharing your story. Okay? Because I mentioned, people can't tell you you didn't experience something. They may question your sanity, but they can't refute your experience. Okay? So I encourage you to write that out and work on that. And then also, I invite you, and I mentioned to you, I've got the verses right here, the Roman Road verses. I invite you to start working on memorizing them. Memorization, it's not easy. How many of you find memorization comes easy to you? Anybody? No, I know I have to work at it. And I got my bell rung really bad several years ago and it got worse. So, uh, 
what can I say? But nonetheless, by memorizing it, if, if you get into a situation where somebody, you're talking with somebody, and, and your Bible isn't handy, it's just there. But even then, I like to use my Bible when I use it. I like to even have them read it. But I know where the verses are. So I don't have to look where, you know, I can just, okay, go to this verse, go to that verse. So I encourage you to do that. So any questions? All right. Well, we have two sessions left after this one. Next week, we're going to talk a little bit about relationships and why they matter. And then session six, a little bit about workplace-specific evangelism. So with that, any final thoughts? Thank you guys so much. Let me close this in prayer. Our God, we do thank you for this day. I thank you for the love you poured upon us. And while we were yet sinners, you died for us, Lord Jesus. Now, God, I pray that you will help us to allow our testimonies and your scripture to speak through to the people around us so that they can know you. They can uh, come to love you and they can come to experience the grace that you've given. Lord, I pray for these uh, these men and this young, this young lady, Lord, that you would uh, empower them, that you would use them during the week, and that you would help them to see opportunities to share your love. It's in Jesus' precious name. Amen.